morning, Rick Noyle here. What a great day. I hope all of you have been having a good time with the Photocon virtual uh, workshops. We uh, Friday and Saturday were epic. We had a great amount of people. Uh, what we're amazed at is how many people are coming from outside of our state, which is really exciting. Um, We've seen people from Poland, Jamaica, Japan, of course, and all over Europe, so very nice. Uh, folks, we've got a couple of things just so that you know. Um, on the right-hand side, there's a chat. We love to see where you're from, so just tag us, even if you're from Ala Moana, whoever said that, that was nice. Uh, we like that. Um, just uh, engage, uh, we've got today, we've got Gabe Biederman, who's a phenomenal photographer. He, um, he has a way, he's kind of like bat-like, I think, because he really comes out at night and Gabe, is his specialty is photographing stars, and he does a magnificent job. Um, he's also co-founder of the National Parks uh, Photography Group and does some fantastic things in a lot of great locations. Um, please enjoy yourself. Uh, if you haven't registered for some of the other workshops today, we have five more after this. Uh, please do. Uh, you can just go online and register. It's all free, and we welcome you. Hello, Gabe. Good morning. Good morning. Aloha, hey. Rick. How are hey, you? I'm alive and well. You look pretty good. That's a nice Aloha shirt, pal. <laughs> you know, it's like I just switched out all the wardrobes here, mm -hmm. you know, put the short sleeves away, but I did keep a key, a couple key ones. Once we, you know, we knew we were going to be doing this. I said, I can't, I can't not virtually come to Hawaii without my Hawaiian shirt. Hey, hey, we like it. I, I'm proud of you that you still got it. That's a good sign, you know. Um, <laughs> and I brought some friends. Hey, 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 we see them. Hey, we, we've got a couple of hula girls, but they don't look like that over here, you know. <laughs> hey, Gabe, how did you get into shooting stars? What, what was your direction that made you say, I want to focus on this, no pun intended? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a self-taught photographer i i did i studied theater mm. i did i did i dabbled in video in college yeah. um and then my, and then my parents for my when a graduation gift you know they just got me a simple point and shoot camera and i and then i drove across country and i fell in love with that little just simple point and shoot camera film camera i shot 80 rolls of film in three mm. weeks and i loved mm. directing because i was a director on the theater side of things and i and it was a lot easier <laughs> to not to, to to direct a single image yeah. and as opposed to you know a uh, whole staff of uh, and crew and everything like that and i just kind of fell in love with it and i and i actually used a lot of the tips that from that theater background putting strong elements in the foreground mm. breaking the fourth wall you know a lot of the those i took as we all do no matter what we do we are better photographers the more we tap into our own mind heart you know, and vision. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, Gabe, it's, it's good to have you back. Uh, you know, we, we enjoyed with you when you were here and um, I'd like to bring in uh, John Fison of B&H Photo just to say hi to everybody. Uh, John, if you're out there, come on in, man. We're looking forward to seeing you. Aloha and good morning. Hey. I, I love the fact that we're all rocking the Aloha shirts. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Well, one of the great things, and I, and I have to drop a, a massive shout out to Western Aloha. That's this Ooh, uh, shirt I have yes. on. Good taste. And, uh, good I taste. I fell, fell in love with them. Mm -hmm. Come out to Hawaii, and the first time I see Zach, we go out there, give him a big handshake, give you a big handshake, and Zach goes, ah, you're wearing a Western Aloha shirt. And I was like, all right, these are my people. Yeah, yeah. Hey, <laughs> this is where I need to be. Hey, well, this is good. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, both of you, for being here and supporting Photocon Hawaii a virtual this year. We really appreciate that, and so does everybody in Hawaii. Um, I'd like to just to turn it over to Gabe. Um, John, if you'd like to stay with us, you're welcome to do it, and um, we'll see you when you're ready. Uh, Gabe, have a good event, and we look forward to All right. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, everyone. And, and aloha to everyone here in the chat room. Uh, really great to see you guys coming out from all over, not just Hawaii, but like Rick said, all over the world. And I am very excited to share um, – you know, my night visions with you guys today, uh, as Rick mentioned, so, you know, night photography, I got into it. When I'm on that, you know, after that road trip, I moved to San Francisco and lived there, and there was a great nocturnal community there. Um, and that's where sort of the, the first educational night photography classes were being taught. And I would just get together with uh, friends. I was getting, you know, getting part of that community and just getting together, and we would shoot um, every month at least we'd kind of shoot back then it was the film day so we kind of had to with film we had to shoot every full moon otherwise 
you know, or, or be in really brightly lit urban scenarios. Uh, but otherwise, if we were getting out to Yosemite, Death Valley, Joshua Tree, something like that, we needed to shoot under the moonlight. Otherwise, there just wasn't enough light to really burn into that film. But it was a great learning experience. Um, and, and, and I've been at it for over 20 years, folks. And I just, I love that with night photography, you know, it, it's the beauty of the unseen. And yes, we're tapping into our eyes and what we're seeing, but we're hopefully also trying to tap into our mind's eye and, and, and understanding the creative and almost endless possibilities you can have when you now really blend time, extend time. And it's not something our eyes can see. You know, if you think about it, our eyes are always working at a fraction of a second. You know, we're collecting all these images all the time. But with night photography, it's now we're operating and doing a 10 second, 10 minute, maybe even a 10 hour, you know, exposure. And there's so many things that you can build and craft into that image. It's so, so exciting. So um, let's see, let's bring up the presentation. Let's get started. <laughs> All right, here we go. And today, you know, I, I wanted this as a brand new presentation. For those of you who've seen some of, you might see some familiar images, um, but I, I really kind of, you know, put this presentation again to kind of give everyone that the the basic skills and or level up those basic skills to intermediate at, le at least on how to level up your night photography skills. Um, so yeah, again, night photography, that, 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 that extending that time, getting past what we kind of see during the daytime. What I'd like to also just say is, you know, on a typical night shoot, I might, I'm happy if I come away with three to five, you know, well-crafted images. And oftentimes it'll take me 30 minutes to one hour to get there, you know, because a lot of the things that we take for granted, like, well, focusing and looking through our viewfinder are taken away. And again, this is especially in rural situations like this image here was in Capitol Reef, Utah. Oftentimes our cameras, yeah, we can gain them up a little bit and that's getting better and that digital technology is gonna to continue to get better, but it is hard to see. It's hard to see a little bit more of the intricacies. So, you know, we have to take our time. We often are taking maybe five, 10, 15 shots to get to that final image that then we kind of, again, hone everything. And I'm really, again, the, the best word is crafting images. and. A night that these night when I was getting really more and more comfortable with night photography, it made me a better daytime photographer. A, I'm operating in manual, so I'm sort of mastering those manual skills and now applying that to my daytime skills. I'm also, you know, really examining the composition and what's in the frame and what do I want in and what I don't I want in there. And that also, again, was able to made me see better during the day. So whether or not you come full into our camp of night photography, you should try it out. Get used, get comfortable with it because again, the skills you'll learn there will definitely make you a better daytime photographer as well. Um, all right, so here we have, again, this is a little bit about uh, me and the group that I started. I'm the co-founder of National Parks at Night and you can follow us. There's our website right there. We're the leading sort of experts on night photography ed education. Um, and so we have a weekly blog, we've got do hands on workshops, we do uh, workshops online. Uh, come check us out. Uh, there it is. There's all the social ways that you can follow us and interact with us. And then finally, uh, Ruinism. That's me. That's my personal Instagram. My website ruinism.com doesn't get much love because I dedicate my time to national parks at night now. But I do try to Give, give that Ruinism uh, Instagram account some love. That, why is it called Ruinism? For me, that's the beauty, the beauty sort of, of decay. And I love a, a little more background of, of where I came and, and what inspires me is I love mythology, I love ancient history, and I love ruins, you know? And I've been doing that, you know, way before all the Herb X stuff was kind of put out there. Not that I'm really Herb Xy, I really, cause I really wanna understand the history of places and I was fortunate enough to live in Greece for nine months in the, in, in, in the Mediterranean. And I love just sinking my teeth into that and really seeing a lot of these places. So that's sort of the balance I'll try to find the, the, with the ruinism. That's my moniker for that 
uh, uh, with there. So, um, and big shout out to B&H. Big shout out to B&H. You know, John and both I work at B&H. You know, when I first got into photography and I was dabbling with it, this professional photographer from France said, Gabe, here's the catalog to B&H. Get yourself the Pentax K1000, a brick of Tri-X, and that's how you're going to take the next step. When I moved to New York in 2001, the first thing I did is I landed on a red eye. I went right to B&H Photo, bought a tripod, a meter um, from this guy that I ended up managing uh, three months later. I was so inspired by that store and being close to all that that community that's there. Uh, I had to get a job. And I, what I will say is, you know, B&H supports me and not like they have my back. They're right beside me. And they really, a lot of the people at B&H were like, Gabe, they push me to, you know, speak at the event space, to uh, have events, to do workshops. They said, we'll support you. We want you, we want, you know, we don't want people just to be a salesperson. You know, we want you to really understand and play with the gear and 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 speak, you know, speak up for the gear and 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 the many things you can do with it. As photographers, you need those tools, you know, and it goes hand in hand, you know, that, you know, the, you need those tools to help again craft those visions. It's hard at B&H. I will say it's very difficult to work there because oftentimes we can be obsessed with the tools. So finding that balance and matching again, figuring out which tools will best, you know, inspire your visions is always great. And, and the people that work there are always there to help guide you along that way. So big shout out to B&H on that. All right. So let's jump in. The way we've I've got this uh, presentation is I want to kind of take a deep dive into several of the important subjects uh, on, that deal with night photography and how we can kind of really, I'm going to share some images, we're going to dive into those, but then we're going to say how do these benefit our visions, our night visions, and how can we excel at that? Now, the first thing is light, right? And the most magical light, you know, one of the first things that we're taught when we are photographers is shoot during the magic hour. Because even if you're shooting okay images, they're going to be better because it's in better light, that magic hour light, those twilights. And whether it's the early morning twilight that I've heard a lot about, very rarely witness, um, or if it's those evening twilights. And we've got three types of twilights, folks. We've got civil twilight, which is, that's to me the most magical. Uh, this image of the um, subway moniker right here is that's during civil twilight. That's when it's its richest deep it's blue deepest blue and that's when you know the sun has set and now is went from you know one to six degrees below the horizon it's just really there's so much color still in the sky from there we go to nautical twilight which is another six degrees so going from seven to 12 degrees you know below the horizon and that's we'll see the first stars in the sky those brightest stars or planets uh, we'll see those during that we still have some blue in the sky, but we're the, the richness is starting to you know fade away. And then finally, there's astronomical twilight, and that is sort of the last twilight's last licks. And then we'll see the little bit of blue in the sky, but that's when really the stars start to come out, and um, and we're really that's the the gateway to night. It's really challenging, you know, shooting during twilight time uh, because light is moving quickly. Especially if you're in Hawaii or you know near the near the equator, your your um your twilights are going to be shorter than if you are you know in the uh, more higher uh, longitudes and stuff like that. You know Alaska has got long, Norway they have cute long hour long twilights sometimes. So you know depending upon the type of year, obviously and and where you are, you can be experiencing. Um, those twilights, but really take advantage of them, seize them, and here are my uh, tips for uh, twilight. Arrive early, like anything, you know, scouting is essential, and whenever I'm going to do a night shoot, I really, I don't care if it's a place I'm really familiar with, I want to arrive there, who knows what's changed, who knows what lighting has gotten different, um, and who knows what Brooklyn car is going to drive by, uh, but, you know, get there early and really, really see what, uh, get a good scout on and enjoy the sunset too. Get there even before the twilight happens. Enjoy a sunset. Those are magical. And and then get your, get set for that. So, and this will help you part of that scouting 
is looking for for different vantage points you know not just going six feet above sea level right looking for high vantage points getting your tripod low and really trying to amplify what you want your vision of this your interpretation of this scene now urban night photography which we're going to talk about more later civil twilight and urban photography are like the perfect match and if you are living in Honolulu or one of the these more urban cities and want to take advantage of you know uh, night photography definitely want to shoot during civil twilight that is you'll you'll find the best balance between when the city lights are now being are now coming up as well as that again cobalt rich blue it's a perfect balance of everything but like i said before you got to monitor that meter because thing you know everything that exposure the light is leaving at a quick pace it's like every eight six seven minutes you know you're losing a half a stop to a stop of light so just keep monitoring that meter our meters and digital cameras are more amazing than ever so monitor that meter make those adjustments and um and really really enjoy that time again and then i talked about nautical and astronomical twilight uh in in the uh, preamble there before but let's take a look here this is um, a panoramic twilight shot, civil twilight shot of Pittsburgh. And I followed all those tips. I scouted during the daytime, found different vantage points, uh, using uh, apps like photo pills to kind of just get a better sense of where the moon and sun are gonna uh, rise and set so I could get a sense of that light. Looking for movement, a key thing, you know, for night photography is how can I, emphasize that movement that's going on. I'm, I know I'm gonna to go to long exposures, so is there water moving? Are there cars moving? Are there clouds moving? How can I really emphasize that and bring that soul to the image? So this was taken, I believe this is a five shot uh, panorama and taken really during that civil twilight. So everything is really so nicely balanced here. And I took the this shot and I kind of scouted a few different locations, but I knew I wanted to be here for the best time, that civil twilight time. And then I, as soon as I got this in the bag, I didn't dally. I knew this was what I wanted. This was like kind of the only location at there uh, and the only composition I want to do. So then I left this spot and ran down to my second location, which is down now at the front line underneath the bridges and really, you know, getting that really much you know more intimate look at downtown pittsburgh but look at that sky is kind of lifeless there um we don't have that rich color in the sky kind of got there really during astronomical twilight there's, there's still a touch of blue in the sky uh, but it's turning into a lot of negative space and that's our challenge with urban photography and that uh, twilight photography is once we are taking those grand landscape shots during civil twilight if then we're once we get to astronomical twilight you know and maybe the and the moon's not out so we don't have the moon brightening the sky then we got a lot of negative space to deal with and you know listen no negative space here right we don't want any negative space or minimize that negative space um and that would be a time to not say stop shooting but now maybe take a closer look or you know looking for detail shots and a closer look so that the sky's not taking over so much of the scene or revisit it. So I love, I really like this composition. I was there at the wrong time. So then the next day I made sure that I was there for civil twilight. And so here we are now a much richer sky. I mean, I wish I had better clouds that day, but there's a much better balance in the scene. This is a single shot image where we have those, especially those bright lights um, right over here um, in the scene. Those are, uh, on that right hand side those are really hard to maintain without getting having them get totally blown out blinky and distract us or lead us over to there when i want you kind of your eyes to be wandering over everything so that was the um the challenge and the success for this one and then this is okay i mentioned that i never see the morning twilight this is one of the few shots i did and I, one i love so dearly and maybe i should do it but this is from uh, Bannerman Island. This is an island about an hour and a half north of New York City. And I'm actually, we're looking at New York City down there, uh, West Point, but it's all covered in fog and it's like 4 a.m. And this light is, I mean, again, just getting back to that magical light. And we see a few star trails here. So here we are, you know, 
in the morning, it starts with astronomical twilight, you know, the reverse, astronomical twilight to nautical twilight to civil twilight to daylight, right? So this is during the last of the twilights. We can kind of see the brightness of the sun kind of making its way through the clouds, you know, a little bit, you know, it's, it's in that one to six degrees still below the horizon, but I love this and I love the color in this. So again, taking advantage of twilight, it, it just will automatically elevate your photography and then stick around. So many times, folks, I've been at shoots and everyone knows magical light, but then, you know, as soon as astronomical hits and nighttime is there, I could be, I could, it was at Cannon Beach in Oregon and there was a hundred people there for the sunset. And then once the sun went down and after, and went, you know, once it became night, I was the only one there. I had the whole place to myself and that can be an amazing now you're not struggling over to your positioning, your tripod, you know, whatever. Um, and so just stay a little bit longer. It can be really, really magical after the magical light. All right. That, now, when we think about um, Milky Way photography, obviously, or when we think of night photography, almost the first thing everyone talks thinks about is the Milky Way image, you know, that has been so synonymous, uh, you know, with uh, night photography that it just that's that's what everyone thinks about. And, you know, why is that? Well, in the film days, you couldn't shoot the Milky Way. You, you, you absolutely couldn't. No film was sensitive enough to have the shorter exposures, the high enough ISO to kind of capture that. And so Milky Way is sort of. Uh, still a new style, a new capture. I mean, it's. So it was really about 15 years ago that we could really start to get those really good uh, quality uh, Milky Way images. But it's really, you know, and, and that it's just certainly blown up. And it's also so few of us have been able to just see it and witness the Milky Way. So not only on the top of everyone's bucket list for night photography is to see and witness, experience the Milky Way, which is amazing and exciting and thrilling, but it's also to capture, to bring home something, to bring home something that excites the viewer just as much as it did you. And, and Milky Way's images still excite people so much. Um, I had to lead off with this shot from Hawaii. This is from uh, Haleakala, from the top of Haleakala. Rick had wonderfully introduced me when my on my visit last year. I went to Maui uh, prior, and I was asking Rick, "Hey, you know, you know anyone I could shoot with?" or you know, where, where I can go, we can chat with. And he introduced me to a really great guy, Cody, who's been a great member and part of the Photocon community. And Cody and I uh, drove that two and a half hours up Haleakala, spent the night. It was cold, <laughs> you know, for Hawaii standards, for sure. We were bundled up, but it was so magical. I really had never experienced the Milky Way above the clouds. And that's it. What you see on that right-hand side that brightness on the right hand side, that's Maui. That's the lights of Maui, but underneath the clouds, right? So we're above the clouds at Haleakala and, and now really seeing the Milky Way in all its glory, looking at the Haleakala Observatory. I just love that. And I'm taking these shots and I'm like, oh man, I really wish we could get a car, you know, to drive up that path. That path is like the perfect S curve. You know, how can we? you know, how can we do that? But I noticed there was a gate there. So obviously, you know, the only person driving up there is someone who's, you know, part of or works at the observatory. And we were shooting for a good 20 minutes and lo and behold, a car pulled up and I said, oh, wait a minute. And they opened the gate, they drove in. And then, and so I'm like, okay, let's click, let's get these shots in. And then they only stayed for about 30 minutes and then drove back out. And this is a, um, this is a sandwich shot of you know, one of the Milky Way, and then I stacked a couple of the car trails in there to add that perfect effect. And it's like, I love when the car trails lead us to the Milky Way or to that important thing in the scene. And that's what just like, this was a very good shot. And then it went up to a yes shot from there. So thank you, thank you, thank you, whoever drove that car up to the observatory. All right, so let's go over some of the tips for Milky Way photography, or let's go even call it star point photography because, you know, we're over the Milky Way season right now, or the last licks, right? You know, you can get maybe right at sunset, you might be able to see it 
uh, for a few more days. But really, for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere, it, we're not going to see the core of the Milky Way uh, until really uh, March, a little bit of February, but really March, April. Uh, the true season is really April, May, you know, through the summer uh, for Milky Way. And those of you in the Southern Hemisphere, you get it year round. So I'm buying that house in New Zealand. I am, I am, I am. I want to see it. I want to witness this, you know, the, uh, you know, the auroras in the Southern Hemisphere. I want to get year round, um, uh, year round Milky Way time. So I'm moving, I'm moving. But here's some key key pieces of gear that you'll need. You'll need to a wide angle lens that is fast. And when I say fast, I mean 2.8 or faster. So, a, a, you know, aperture, maximum aperture of 2.8, 2.18, 1.4, something in that range. That's going to be your key. And why a wide angle lens? Well, you want to get as much of the Milky Way as possible. So a 50 millimeter lens really isn't going to cut it because it's going to be really hard to compose you know, 24 millimeter or even wider. I usually love, you know, for me, my Milky Way lens uh, collection would be anything from 14 millimeter to 24 millimeter. Those will give me the options I need to compose interesting things in the foreground with that um, Milky Way arching, you know, uh, Milky Way in the sky. Now, getting a camera, most cameras are pretty good at 3,200 ISO these days. Most cameras are even good at 6,400 ISO. Um, it's the cameras from the last two years that are really can be comfortable at 12,800 or even higher. And that's the key, folks. That'll just give us more options. If you are comfortable with shooting at 6,400, 12,800 or even higher with your camera, that'll give you a little bit more flexibility with your shutter speeds and maybe stopping down your aperture uh, for depth in the scene. So everyone's a little bit different. Everyone, you and I can own the same camera and I can be very comfortable with it at 12,800. And you might be like, eh, I like it really at 64 inches, the max. What I will say is the Milky Way is granular, right? So noise, you know, especially the high ISO granular noise it kind of complements the Milky Way. So I kind of, I don't mind, you know, I'll, I'll be a little bit more uh, lenient with those higher ISOs. Now I might take a another exposure at a lower ISO for the foreground if the foreground is um, really important in the scene. Uh, so I have a cleaner foreground. That might be my balance of a lower ISO uh, cleaner foreground and a higher ISO uh, sky that's gonna freeze those stars to points. All right, aperture, and we've talked about ISO. The final thing, of course, is, okay, uh, shutter speeds. What is the maximum shutter speed that we can get before stars start to trail? And now with our higher megapixel cameras that are out there, we're starting to notice stars starting to trail sooner than ever. We used to have the 600 rule that we changed to the 500 rule, and now there's the 400 rule. And I've kind of done away with all those rules and really applying myself to the NPF rule to figure out your maximum shutter speed. And here's our math for the day, but basically the 400 rule, or if those of you have heard of the 500 rule, it's the same thing. You apply your full frame focal length and you divide that into 400. So let's say our um, you know 15 millimeter lens here, divide that into 400 equals 26 seconds. That's a lot of time to play with. That's actually really decent. But what we've noticed, again, when we blow up that image large, you know, if we want to make a large print, that's probably good for Instagram. But if we want to blow up that image art large, we will see that those stars are just little lines and they're not points. So if you got PhotoPills, which is to me the best app out there for daytime and nighttime photographers, you're going to go into the Star Trails pill right here and you're going to go into are gonna set all of the elements here. You're gonna have put in your camera, put in your focal length, put in your aperture, your azimuth. And then you've got something over here called the default rule. And what it'll say is, here's the NPF rule for 15 millimeter is 17.26 seconds. Now they use the 500 rule, which is 33 seconds. I'm using the 400 rule, same rule, same division. Uh, I'm just being a little bit more conservative on there and that's 26 seconds. Now the NPF default rule is good. 
that's a good starting point and it's a good balance now because if you think about it we've pretty much lost a lot of uh, one stop of light from that 400 rule so we're going to have to either open up our aperture a little bit more or go to one more stop of ISO, go higher in the ISO. So wow, if we're at 12,800, we might have to go to 25,000, you know, so we can see where, where we're going here with that. It's all about the juggle and the balance. What I will say about the default rule, that's gonna look good on images probably up to about 11 by 14 or so, but if you really are gonna be, you know, making uh, 16 by 20 or 17 by 22, images then you probably want to go with the npf accurate rule which takes away pretty much another stop of light you see we've dropped from 17 seconds to about eight seconds you know so again now we're gonna have to we lost one more stop of light we're gonna have to apply it somewhere else um, and generally that's going to be that um those isos unless we have a really fast lens okay so here's the you know I, not there's not you know there's good starting points but it's a juggle so you know use the 400 rule uh, download the the photo pills app and you know balance find that balance while you're out there bracket it try them at both you know i definitely when i'm shooting the milky way i'll do a, one shot at the 400 one shot at, at the default one shot at accurate so that i have options because you never know when an image is like might be like oh it's okay but then when you get it home and you kind of massage it and post-processing you're like oh my goodness this is actually a a five-star image and now i really want that uh to be a, even be able to blow that up even more without the need to getting those star trails here's a shot now a lot of um milky way shots also require like i said possibly blending the images and a popular thing to do is get a shot during twilight light and you can get that optimal, more optimal ISOs uh, down and then wait for that Milky Way. This is Lhasa National Park. And I saw with photo pills also has an augmented reality. When we hiked up this uh, cinder cone volcano, right at the base, I immediately pulled out photo pills because I love this simple composition. And I said, oh, my goodness, that's it. The Milky Way rises right at the top of it. We're going to come back and do this image. So this is the final image. But I wanted to share with you a couple images of how I got there. Here you can see this is the sort of the twilight shot of it. And I'm not really worried about the sky when I'm taking this. I'm really worried about getting a information, a decent amount of information in that on that landscape. You know, I don't want it to reveal too much. I also want it to look like it's shot at night. So it's sort of an underexposed. Uh, landscape shot, but has a probably shot at about 400, 800 ISO. So much cleaner than I would if I was shooting at 6,400. So here's my shot. Now I don't move my tripod and I wait an hour, you know, once we get through the twilights and I, and then I take that shot. Okay. And we can see that shot is now the Milky Way in all its glory, perfectly placed. And, you know, that, I mean, that's a good shot. And we see a lot of Milky Way shots with a silhouetted foreground, but that's a lot of negative space. And maybe I use light painting to open it up. But even better is, again, blending that twilight or daytime shot afterwards to just perfectly marry that. And that's now we're talking about, again, pre-visualizing and really, and again, really crafting that image. I had to make sure that tripod didn't move for about two hours once I got that shot. That's why I always go with two two setups. So I can have that one set up, put like the do not disturb markings around it and go take some other shots and, and keep myself uh, occupied and clicking. Here's another shot that I wanted to show a little bit of behind the scenes on. This is one of my favorite shots from the year before, and this was shot in Joshua Tree. Arches, everyone loves arches. Everyone loves how Milky Ways can intersect with arches. Um, and it's funny, this one that I got here, the key thing for me was finding my own skull rock or arch here. And then I saw with, again, with photo pills that the Milky, that the Milky way and the core of the Milky way was going to kind of come right through that eye. Right. And I call this one, the mind's eye. And I was like, Oh, cool. This is where I'm setting up. But in reality, this was a very difficult shot to get because this arch probably 
what was as high as my knee, maybe my thigh. So this is something very small and intimate that I wanted to look make look grand by shooting low. And let's see how I got there. So like this is the first the first shot I got of it. You know, at from this angle, I got a little bit more of a, a you know a bigger hole through the eye, but I could also see that the core of the Milky Way wasn't going to align with it. So I need I knew I needed more a move more to the left. This is and also folks, this is an unprocessed high ISO shot. I always kind of start my scene with those kind of shots. I don't care. You can see the grain and the noise everywhere on this, but I'm going to take, like I said, five, 10 shots to just see. So then I, I said that I, it was hard and it's hard also with those high ISO images to see if you're in focus because it's so granular. So I stopped down, I took a cleaner shot um, and saw that again, the core was peeking in, uh, but I, really wasn't going to align as much. So I had to, you know, really splay those legs down and make really very small movements. And it took me, I was looking at the shots. I took about 20 shots to finally get there. I'm only going to share a few with you, but I also tested the light painting here. And this is from uh, the Luxly LED light just to see. And that's a nice light. It creates really soft light and that helped me focus. And that helped me look really see my composition a little bit better. But I was like, you know, this lighting is, is really kind of you know, blah, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it's more revealing light than characteristic light. And we get more characteristic light when we kind of really um, light paint from the, from an oblique angle and pull out the grain and the texture of those images. So this is now me using a flashlight instead of the Luxley, a harder beam and just a quick pass to uh, really see what kind of light painting I also need to do for this image. And I really liked where this was going because it was, creating really some beautiful detail, but also creating shadows. We can very easily call this shadow painting just as much as light painting. But then I needed to, you know, now get down lower and make adjustments. And again, I took another 10 shots on this shot. I get, all right, I'm getting as low. I can see the core now through the eye, but I don't like that other rock on the right-hand side. I don't like that little lip of the eye over there, you know, so I took a few more shots to again, finally get to this image here. And again, this probably took me a good hour and a half. Another challenge of this is I'm also, I'm, I'm sort of in a little crevice here. I can only back up so much. So I also had to take uh, a focus stack, this image as well. One focus shot for, you know, the skull rock and another focus shot for infinity for the stars. It was really hard to get them all in in the same image. So. A lot of work post on this, um, but I also tried to get a lot of that work done uh, in camera as well to give myself the most opportunities to really, you know, massage uh, my that vision out. And then finally, Milky Way shot, you know, doing the panorama Milky Way, you know, getting that, that's all, you know, once we get the Milky Way high in the sky, we also want to get that arching Milky Way, which is often done with a panoramic image. And this is a shot, this is a combination of 10 images. I basically did a row of images um, stacked along uh, for the sky that were those shorter exposures for star points, so 10, 20 seconds. But then that put my foreground all in, you know, silhouette. So then I came back down, you know, and, and, and took, five minute shots at a lower ISO that were that was overexposed from what my sky exposure was um, by about three stops to still get us some detail, get us some more information so that we can really kind of spend time just looking all throughout this scene. And I really, really like like the scene. It took a lot, a lot of work, you know, for this, a, a multi-row pano. Um, and I could teach a whole class, you know, on this one, but I wanted to show you again the possibilities uh, for Milky Way photography. Now, usually the other end of things is the moon. And as popular as the Milky Way is, the moon really isn't that popular these days. Most most people that call themselves night photographers won't even go out uh, when there is a full moon. And that's kind of a sad thing. And I appreciate Stan the other day teaching a moon lit uh, night photography class. I love it. And maybe moons is now starting to trend a little bit more. People are starting to see you know, us taking those moon shots against like, like the Statue of Liberty, Empire State Building. So really 
now thinking about playing the moon against the landscape. And there's a lot of things we can do with the moonlight. Like I said, I grew up as a night photographer shooting under the moonlight. We needed that full moonlight in the film days. So here's some tips. First is the question, are you shooting the moon or are you shooting the under the serious moonlight? You know, that's sort of what you need to kind of figure out. And you could do both, obviously, the same night. Um, but if you want to shoot that sort of a close up of that crater licious moon, you're going to want a telephoto lens, uh, maybe shoot at, you know, during twilight. Uh, the day before the full moon is best because the moon will rise a little bit higher in the sky. So you can really have more opportunity to place it against interesting intersections with man-made or natural landscapes. So, or as I often do, I like including the moon, A, because it, it'll have some nice dramatic backlighting to it. And I love interpreting it as a beacon of light, almost like that, you know, star a giant star that's sort of in the sky and kind of, you know, is, is that driving force of that image. Now, again, the deep, if you want that detail shot, that Cratalicious, use that telephoto lens. Clouds can be a challenge. So if you're definitely shooting that detail shot or even a wider shot, bracket and balance your exposure uh, so that your clouds are not getting blown out. You know, again, our eyes are drawn to the brightest part of the scene. And if we have a blown out area, We'll, our, the, the viewer's eyes are going to look there instead of maybe looking at the, the real subject uh, and where you want to direct people in the scene. As I mentioned earlier, moonlit, moonlight will also balance urban scenes. So that's a great time um, during a half moon to a full moon to shirt, shoot urban night photography. You know, again, we have the challenges of twilight, but once that moon is up, that's actually now bringing that blueness back to the sky, that brightness back to the sky. So we're having less of that negative space to deal with. So I love shooting uh, urban night photography under the moonlight. And again, most people call the moon the star eater. And yes, if you're shooting in the general direction of the moon, obviously the moon is blowing out the stars in that area. But if you look opposite, you're still gonna see a lot of stars. Um, and, and especially the bright ones, the planets, et cetera. My advice to you is to just shoot, especially if you're new to it, or again, if you're comfortable night photography, but only shoot new moons, go out and explore all the phases of the moon. You know, there's amazing, you know, when the moon, when the moon is at a crescent and just kind of kisses the landscape with a little bit of light, that's a perfect time when we can still do Milky Way and landscape and get it all done in the same shot. Um, I love really just enjoying all the phases, and I invite you guys to explore those as well. So here's an image again, including the moon, um, and this is a single shot. Yeah, I could have superimposed a craterlicious moon after that, but, but to me, it kind of seems fake um, here. And I just, it's not a beacon, but it's a bright light source here, and we can see it. We can see how that moonlight is just reflecting on the water, and I love moonlight on the water. It's beautiful and just adds that drama to the scene. Again, the backlighting and the shadow from that Stiltsville house is just amazing. Now here's more of the beacon of light and, and, and again the urban, shooting the Brooklyn Bridge, looking at Brooklyn um, and getting the moonlight again, the reflection of that as well as the city lights in Brooklyn all plain. I mean, I'm, I look at this image and I can look at it forever because my mind is, or my eyes are just kind of wandering all throughout the scene. There's a, a great amount of shadows, light, and texture, and information that I can really just wander around this uh, scene for a good long time. And then this is one of my favorite shots. I've been kind of writing about this shot, revisiting this shot, uh, the super moon shot of the um, of, of the moon rise. And this lasted for two minutes, but luckily I had a telephoto lens, a 100 to 500 lens that got me in there and kind of cropped in. And we, I dealt with those clouds. It, I did a little bracketing. I took six shots and it was that half a second shot that kind of balanced and had detail in the moon, but also no blown out skies. This is a, no blown out clouds. This is a single shot shot folks. And amazing what we can now do with a telephoto lens and make that moon just as important as that bridge. 
this was shot the morning before um, as the moon was setting. And uh, again, we think of star trails, which we'll talk about, but what about moon trails, right? This is, I think, about a 15-minute shot of the moon going to bed, you know, and it was just dipping out of the scene. And yeah, we don't see any many stars around there, but I love that movement, that kind of moon trail. And that's something that uh, a lot of people are just now starting to dabble with, and a lot of creative possibilities can be had with moon trails. And John, this one's for you. Um, again, under the moonlight, not including the moon as a subject at all, but I couldn't have got the rich amount of blues in this scene. This scene that is, to me, I saw it. This is in South Beach, Florida, and I wanted to create a Rothko painting. You know, I wanted to create different levels of blue in an abstract way, and I didn't want any sign of a ship, a building, or anything that would give it scale. The only thing that gave it scale was maybe that horizon line, which really is just another paintbrush stroke of blue. I didn't want to include any stars. I didn't want to give it a sense. I wanted to give it sort of that timeless sense of just that you can wander through those tones. Uh, and I couldn't have, again, done that without that benefit of that moonlight bringing out the richness in those colors. All right, let's talk about star trails. And star trails, now, I mean, it's, it's funny, but people are now, oh, it's winter time, so Milky Way season's over. Star trail, it's star trail season now. Uh, for me, star trail season is year round. I, I'm taking a star trail shot almost every time I'm out shooting because, again, that's one of the ways that we can, that we can show movement. And for me, movement is so key for night photography, you know, and, and here, this is in Joshua Tree. There's no water to emphasize movement. There's no cars you know, going through these rocks. So my one thing that I can showcase movement and give it, again, that heightened sense of like, what is this? This is not something that I'm seeing with my eye is by getting those stars to trail and taking enough exposures that as our earth rotates, we're getting this amazing, amazing sort of movement. We can see that North Star, you know, for us on the Northern Hemisphere, we got that North Star, which pretty much stays like a pinpoint, and then all the other stars around it can align it. This is at about an hour and a 15 minute exposure of me stacking successive four minute shots. And again, under the moonlight, the little bit of rocks that you could see under the moonlight are now are revealed and again i was just important for me to look at this what the moon was revealing as well as well as the shadows it was creating as well all right a couple tips for uh star trails and star stacking is you got to turn off your long exposure noise reduction this is often the default and on in most cameras and it's called long exposure noise reduction or sometimes people call it l e n r um, so turn that off because oftentimes when that does, when that's on, if you take a one minute exposure, it's going to do one minute of this in camera, you know, uh, Photoshop, which is basically dark frame subtraction and your camera will not be usable. And you'll have, instead of star trails, you'll have star brails because you can, you can't take, it won't allow you to take a picture uh, once every one minute or however. So turn that off. Set your intervalometer, whether it's in a camera or with a, you know, a intervalometer, a, a, a wired or wireless intervalometer. Set that at one second so that we're taking shots every one second. I generally prefer to take exposures at one minute to five minute and then blend those together in post. And that's a very simple, easy thing, you know, for us to do in Photoshop as well as there's plenty of apps. You take all of them together, bring them into Photoshop and go to the blend mode, which is usually default to normal, and you set it to a lighten, and that connects all the bright dots in the scene. It's magical, it's beautiful. Um, just let's talk about lung exposure noise reduction just for another minute or two. Um, this is again, um, what it will look like in a menu similar to that. Um, and it's good to test and figure out what your camera's capable of. A lot of cameras are capable of shooting four to six minute shots outside without us getting long exposure noise. Now there's two types of noise. We've got high ISO noise that we got to deal with and that's totally the ISO, the ISO we choose um, and it will get grainier the higher we go. But long exposure noise reduction comes in and is more colorful and that's not a good thing. 
<laughs> noise. It's like confetti colors, red, green, blue uh, colors that are going to come in to the scene because your camera is really a computer and the processor is being overworked with these long exposures and it's getting hot and generating noise in the scene. So you have to test it out. And I advise testing it out in different uh, temperatures. You know, weather plays a key thing. And if it's hot out, your noise is gonna get, is gonna come into the scene quicker. Ideally, you're shooting below 60 degrees at night. So top of Haleakala, no problem, <laughs> you know. Um, but base of Hawaii on the beach, especially in the summertime, 90 degrees, you know, you might be limited to 30 second exposures before noise starts to creep in. Again, we can alleviate it by turning on long exposure noise reduction, but if we're gonna make star trails, then that is going to be difficult um, for, for that because we, you know, it's gonna have that long exposure noise reduction eating up that time. So just a couple example shots to show you. This was in natural bridges. Um, here we can see the bridge, the granularity we see in the rocks in the sky. That's from the high ISO noise of 6400. And I don't have noise reduction on, but we can see a little fleck here, a little fleck there, some of these brighter, colorful flecks. That is long exposure noise. Ah, Gabe, it's not that bad right there. You know, um, I can maybe live with that. I can remove that easily in post. But if we turn our noise reduction, you can see that takes it away right away. So for star point photography, yeah, um, I keep that long exposure noise reduction on, especially if it's hot and we're doing Milky Way shots. Uh, star point shots. But we go longer, we double that. Now we're here at 90 seconds and we can see those flecks are coming in way more prevalent uh, in the scene. So that's no noise reduction and that's with noise reduction easily cleaning up the scene. You know, going for those epic star trail shots, this is, and thinking about stacking them, this is dry tortugas in Florida. And this is about a 45 minute stack. It, I, I took enough to do an hour and a half, but what would happen is the clouds along the horizon kind of started coming into the scene and then just it, it, it took away from it. And when you stack clouds, uh, it has this herringbone effect that is really not appealing uh, to it. So this was sort of the max amount of, of Star Trail, which to me, you know, and this is under the moonlight, um, it just doesn't read as well as it could. But luckily this was on my scouting trip. So I knew that when I went back, uh, and brought and we brought a workshop back that I was going to then do at least a four hour exposure, and that's what a four hour star trail exposure um, will look like there. And that was really kind of more of what I was going for for that those star trails. There's another, but again, not you know when we think of the star trail, don't always go go the longest one. Don't always you know, default to shooting an hour plus star exposures. This is a 15 minute shot. And this emphasizes the movement, the stars just as well, right? You know, sometimes those the, the, those epic star trails can be too chaotic and too much and overtake the scene. So, you know, balancing and really playing and exploring time with night photography. Urban night photography, I live in Brooklyn, New York City, so this is something I get to play with a lot and I love doing it and finding that balance. You know, here is, you know, a shot where we're emphasizing movement of the car trails, shot during twilight, and with the addition of the tribute and light uh, lights on. Urban tips, which are kind of a combination of the tips that we've been talking about, scout, 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 right? Looking for those vantage points. For me, that image, was so key because I was on top of, of the bridge looking down, you know? So if we can get above those bigger things, look down or even emphasize more power to them by going low. So finding those different vantage points, taking advantage of twilight, but most importantly, reinterpreting the city. Now with movement, we can really bring a magical essence and soul to the city and kind of flip it, see what you can kind of play with, with time. And again, once maybe, you know, the, the negative space creeps in, look for detail shots. And finally, being safe with friends. You know, obviously, uh, you know, urban shooting, we're going to bump into people, you know, throughout throughout our shoot. Um, go shoot with friends. The camaraderie that happens is amazing. And, you know, and the safety, of course, is also so important.
for everyone involved. So let me show you, share with you a couple images that key in on those points. I think this is my longest star trail shot uh, uh, taken to date. This is a six hour star trail stack um, looking down uh, from the San Gabriel Mountains. So looking into the sprawl of LA, of suburban LA. And so yes, you can do star trails in urban locations. Those you'll probably have to shoot when there is little to no moon. Here's the top of Twin Peaks in San Francisco. Scouted that, but most people look the other way. I knew that it's a one way coming in and out and I could maybe create an island uh, surrounded by white and red car lights. And then kind of, this is uh, looking, not a detail shot necessarily, but this is, you know, the, now you know, there's, a, there's a lot, the moon wasn't out, there was a lot of negative space. So I went underneath and really kind of looked for the details of the city and shot it wide, but filled the scene with the, with the city lights. And here's more of a detail shot. So here I am, you know, near around one of those bridges, but again, it's getting too dark. So now I instead looked for those wonderful details of the bridge, shot it wide open for beautiful bokeh and, uh, and have this, you know, better telling of the story. We want to tell the story wide, but all the way down to the details of it. All right, light painting is sort of, that's the last thing that most people master or spend their whole time uh, mastering. And just like lighting for daytime photography, practice, 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 and, and get making sure you're having uh, the right tools to play with. This shot from Alabama Hills is using a variety of tools. It's using two Luxley LED lights, one underneath uh, Lady Boot Arch there, that's getting that beautiful light underneath that arch right there. Then I used a flashlight, matched the color temperature to the Luxley, so I gelled that flashlight, and that's what's getting me this light right along the outer edge of that. Then I came, along, uh, came closer, and these rocks, they were okay, you know, but I wanted to get a little bit more detail, a little bit more information. Um, in there so i used that low power led light again and just for a second skimmed it across the rocks um, from an oblique angle that kind of brought us a little bit better leading line up into the scene light painting is like that is the director's tool in night photography and now we can really lead people where exactly we want to go because again we're creating uh, the light and the shadows and really uh, helping tell those stories better than ever. Flashlights, we love the the, the uh, Coast flashlights. Uh, they are uh, zoomable. They have a clean beam. Um, and I have one of each of these because having a low power 19 lumens is good and important for us to deal with uh, light painting, you know, that when you're close to the subject. But then having that HP 7R is good. Having that 300 lumen output really helps us, you know, light paint stuff that's 100 meters, 100 feet away um, for, uh, for light painting options. And again, this is probably the most popular tool and the easiest one to use is um, an LED light. We love this Luxley uh, Viola Mark II just because you can dial in any color temperature as well as any color. You get, it's a really a versatile one. So, you know, getting one that you put gels on is kind of a pain. Getting one that's bicolor, so it's either tungsten or daylight, limits our options. We can really customize things with the Luxley uh, LED lights. The main lesson I'll tell you is don't light, just like, you know, with flash photography, don't light from where you're shooting, right behind the camera. That's going to give you the flattest, most boring light out there. You know, boom, there's that Joshua tree not looking good, not looking healthy at all because there's no texture to it. It's just like a deer in the headlights. Ah, light from the side, light from the side and bring in characteristic lighting from one side, from the other, play around with it. I often might take three to 10 shots of light painting to figure it out. And sometimes I have to do multiple things. And like we kind of talked about with the moon, don't forget backlighting. Backlighting can add a sense of drama to the scene. Include the light, just like we include the moon 
as a beacon of light. You can actually use a flashlight to kind of also draw your attention. And the flashlight is, is the direct light source here, but also did all the side lighting in each one of those rows uh, inside Fort Jefferson here. And this is using an infrared flashlight. Um, and I ran around this whole scene. This probably took me about two to three minutes to light paint this whole scene with an infrared flashlight and an infrared camera. Infrared, not just for day. All right, let's talk about weather. Weather can be a key thing for us to, to deal with day and night, right? Um, we did a workshop last year in San Francisco, not during fog season, but well, you know, Carl the Fog did come by and visit us for pretty much the whole workshop and it ended up being a fogtography workshop. But it was magical because, you know, flashlights and direct light sources are really, wow, they're so powerful and, and amazing, you know, with, with under that fog. It's just amazing what you can do. But clouds are sort of the common thing that we're going to have to deal with. And cloud movement is just as cool as star movement, as water movement, as all those other things. However, you got to keep an eye on it because sometimes usually cloud movement is good from, you know, 30 seconds to about four minutes. Once it gets past four minutes, it kind of it can lose a lot of the detail and just then becomes just kind of a smear in the sky. And we don't want that. We don't just want a white, white sky. Uh, and there we want to be able to see the texture of the cloud. So play around with that your your exposures in that I would say 30 second to uh, four minute range because again, it all depends how windy it is, what the clouds are are moving, and what kind of clouds are to create that extra emphasis and movement in the scene. Clouds sometimes bring rain, and rain can be super magical, especially at night. You know the reflections. The car trails, again, the clouds in the scene, you know, don't hide, you know, even if you're, if you're hiding, maybe just duck from one awning to the other, but keep clicking, keep exploring those exposures, even in bad weather. It's so funny, lighthouses. I mean, it's so funny. We did this workshop a couple of years ago and the first night it was going to be rainy and overcast and everyone was so bummed out. They're like, oh, tomorrow's going to be, can we switch to tomorrow? Tomorrow's going to be the clear night. We want to get the, get the, you know, get the Milky Way and the lighthouse with it on a clear night. I'm like, <laughs> you know, wait and see, right? Just wait and see because there's a reason why lighthouses were built and they were not built for good weather, right? And that's it. A lighthouse stands tall in all of its drama when its beams can be reflected in the clouds. It's amazing. And we could just take multiple shots, you know, and, and or use a black card to kind of just time it on one long exposure to create these sort of epic beam shot of lighthouses. And we can only do that in bad weather. And snow. Snow can be captured a variety of ways. I know if, I, I, when's the last time it snowed in Hawaii, but again, we are, you guys might visit us in New York or other places around the world. Snow can be captured a couple different ways. And the beauty of snow, unlike rain, is snow is white and reflective. And we can use a flash to freeze. Not Flashlights, not so much, but a flash that can put out a big burst of light can freeze the snowflakes forever in that spot. So I can usually, if I'm that image on the left, I think I popped the flash two or three times to kind of culminate the snow and make it seem like an even snowier scene. The image before that, I didn't need to use a flash because I had that light again from the subway light backlighting it and really illuminating the snow. And this snow was like thick and large. And I, instead I went to like, I think this is like a fourth of a second, eighth of a second exposure to create that confetti like snow. And the final thing, guys, I want to talk about um, is night portraits and the beauty of night portraits. This is something, this is sort of the next moon. This is the next trend that we're seeing going on in night photography. And we've been doing that for, again, over eight, 10 years. We've been taking night portraits. And we love, again, whether it's the tools, like this image is a self-portrait of myself taken with a 360-degree camera inspired by the little prints. Right, I wanted to create this little world, this night world that's being wrapped by the Milky Way, and I use my light to kind of shine and and give a little detail into the scene. However, just taking those night portraits, and okay, all right, I slipped in a little sunset twilight one, but I tell you something, for this, I'm putting it in my night portraits because I'm using a 
I think I'm using a six stop ND and a graduated ND, and this is about a 20, 30 second exposure. I put a self timer on, walked into the scene, stood still for that 20, 30 seconds and walked back out. I love the movement in the water. I love the movement in the sky and the sun setting, the colors, the balance. And Gabe, no one can stand still for one second. Are you just a magician and can do it for 20 or 30 seconds? What's going on? Well, a lot of times when we do night portraits, especially if they're going to have to be standing still for a long time, don't make them so big in the scene. Put them farther away. Because, yeah, I didn't stand still. There's a little movement in here. But because I'm smaller in the scene, you don't see that. And plus, you're being blown away by all the other colors, composition, and everything else going on. So that's a key thing. You know, yes, if you can freeze them with a flash, make them big. You know, but if they're going to be asked to stand still for a long amount of time, put them farther away in the scene. Or, or play with the movement. You know, here's a picture I took of my good friend Matt on a workshop. And I used a flash, popped it. And then had to move out of the scene. But because he was wearing a white shirt, the, it was still sort of reflective. And I said, hold still, as he turned away for a little bit. So he held in that sort of walking away position for four seconds. So you can add this extra now totally amazing movement um, in there with portraits as well. You can create double exposures, triple exposures. You can talk to yourself. You can create a whole big scene with this sort of thing. And the storytelling that can happen is amazing. I really, this was one of my first night, uh, night portraits, and I love this. It's simple. It's easy. Uh, just using the flashlight. You know, he's shining the flashlight. I think I used a, another flashlight, a warmer flashlight, to scrape this, uh, the scene on the, um, on the Fountain of Youth wall here. Um, and this was just an amazing uh, shot. I really love, love this, this image. And then, however, this is my favorite. I took this last year, and this is sort of a combination of all the elements. And as you kind of piece and put things together this is it and this I, I used a flash and I'm going back to my directing skills you know my theater skills and we work together this is a collaboration with the model we're working on this together I'm sharing to her with her what I'm doing and and she's acting and and, and in the scene as well so we we placed her to, and we said okay hold still this is the the, the uh, pose that I want you to use Pop the flash, froze her, and then he said, hold still, walk towards the camera, and then when she got right up to the camera, I said, hold, hold, and out her hold for like four seconds and then walked out of the frame, and that's how you get the shadow, the soul of her kind of coming out like that, and this is something I definitely want to explore uh, even more with night portraiture work is adding that movement and really finding that essence in the uh, scene. All right, so I know I went a few minutes over, um, but there are more ways you could continue to learn more about night photography with me and National Parks at Night. First off, we've got a five-hour class at Creative Live. It is a, it's called Night Photography Week, and there's five different courses. Uh, so it's actually 20 hours of learning um, on that. Take a look at that. If you haven't already gotten my book, Night Photography from Snapshots to Great Shots, Get it. It's a great book, um, and we'll really go over a lot of the stuff we went with in much more detail. If you are a Kelby One member, um, I did a video for Kelby One, so that's part of their subscription uh, plan. It's called Seize the Night and Photography Tips, and we uh, shot all around New York City uh, for those uh, for that video. I think it's like an hour, hour and a half long on that. And then finally, you know, again, just a reminder, here's how you can learn with us. And again, if you do sign up for our newsletter at National Parks at, uh, if you sign up for our, our newsletter at nationalparksatnight.com, you get a free ebook uh, uh, called Seize the Night, 20 Tips for Photographing in the Dark. So if you're not already on our email list, sign up. Um, I, I encourage you to sign up for our weekly blog, as well as when we do workshops. Our workshops, we have a very strong alumni base, and they do sell out quick. Uh, we do. We did launch our season six, so our, our of our twenty two workshops we're offering next year. We have about three or four left. Uh, but sign up on the wait list, folks. Who knows what's going to happen? You know, we're definitely in putting all safety protocols in place for these, and these are you know small, you know, ten to fourteen max, uh, you know, people uh, on these workshops uh, that are really uh, having a great. You know, the best way to do it is to get out and do it and do it with friends and with educators that can help guide you 
into seizing the night. So I think that wraps it up. If we want to bring John back into the end here, and we, I think we've got some time for some Q and A's. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Gabe, you know, a lot of very good positive feedback uh, on the presentation. And it, it, it's amazing for me knowing you 10 years, traveling all over the world with you, actually shooting with you to, to sit through these presentations and continue to learn, see new stuff. It's, it's an evolution that I'm, uh, you know, honored to say that I was able to watch you grow. I mean, the first time we took a 360 camera out, I think we took more pictures of us having drinks after trade shows. <laughs> and then you evolved it into an, an art form. Right, 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 right. <laughs> exactly. You know? <laughs> you know, so before we get into the Q&A, there was a lot of conversation going on and, and we have a myriad of uh, skill sets and uh, levels within shooting throughout this. So uh, thank you and kudos to all of the attendees that were part of this Photocon community answering questions for other photographers. Uh, Steven, I got to give you a shout out. You, you beat me at about every time I tried to get out there and, and say anything. Um, one of the overwhelmingly large ones is is kind of I don't want to say best practices, but uh, if you have almost a, a recommendation for a starter kit or someone that's just uh -huh. getting into it, yep. you know, and one of them sure. was, uh, you know, have you ever shot extremely wide? If so, what lens did you use? Would you would you say a yep. Rokinon sure. versus this? So, you know, maybe let's talk for a few moments before we get into the Q&A of for the people that are on this thread that are just getting started. Obviously, you literally wrote the book. So buy the book <laughs> and Gabe's book will <laughs> be able to answer a lot of these questions for you. But um, what would be the one lens tripod and camera that you would say would be a great investment for a starter night photography shooter? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. First uh, lens, you know, I, it, it, that can vary so much um, with it. But what I will say is, yeah, I really love the IRIX, I-R-I-X, manual focus lenses. They uh, have two lenses. They have 15 millimeter 2.4, and then they have an 11 millimeter F4. And a lot of the work you saw was from either one of those lenses. Um, I love those lenses, because, especially the 15. I gravitate more. The 15 is going to be a little bit better suited for Milky Way stuff because it's an, a, you know, a, a stop, you know, a little actually stop and a quarter more than the... Um, uh, than the F4 lens, uh, but I, I really like those. They come in Nikon, Canon, and I think they just announced Sony mount as well as Pentax mount. Uh, it's also with Canon and, and Nikon, it's their sort of the DSLR mount, but I'm sure they're going to, you can either use adapters or I'm sure they'll be coming out with the mirrorless mounts as well. That being said, I'd also say, again, wide and fast so whether it's canon I, I look towards their 16 to 35 you know or fifth you know 16 to 35 2.8 15 to 30 um nikon sigma 14 24 2.8 those would be go-to lenses uh for it uh tripod you know that's a tricky thing and what i'm going to do if i can i'm going to drop a link in here um uh, to a tripod guide and this is a ebook that we came out with because uh, there's so many tripods to choose from. But basically, finding one that matches your size, because we're all different sizes, matches your budget, because you can get a tripod from $25 to $2,000, you know, and then, and then finally matches what other things you want it to do. So really, for tripod use, I would recommend looking at that. My favorite, my favorite two tripods, I'd probably say, love the Peak Design Travel Tripod. For it's definitely it's portability. The head I've got some issues with, um, but I can get over them enough. Uh, but my go-to, like on a desert island tripod, would be probably the Gitzo Traveler tripod uh, series two, matched with an Acrotec um, GPSS ball head with a lever clamp, and that's in the um, the tripod guide there. But that's a combination that's probably going to run someone about a thousand dollars. So that's not in everyone's budget, but. You know, Manfrotto has a ton of options uh, that are solid and good, uh, you know, from $100 to $300 that you could easily get yourself. Fantastic. There. And you just ticked off about four questions that I had queued up. So uh, that was a great, great <laughs> soft pitch right into to handling it. You know, you and I have had a couple of these conversations, Gabe, and, and the, the artistry for me 
and, and I want all of the attendees that are still here, the, the artistry is what really separates. And, and a lot of people get bogged down in the technique. There's a lot of questions. Technique is, is very important. And, and Gabe has a great section on that in his book. But spending the time that Gabe said of the thought, right? What am I trying to capture? Mm -hmm. um, that was the number mm -hmm. one thing I've taken away from every time I've had the opportunity to shoot with Gabe as well as if you plan on being out with Gabe for four hours, it's going to be 10 hours. So <laughs> just, <laughs> just plan on that. But a, as yeah. we go from the artistry of it, uh, you know, there are a lot of questions that people have. And, and April actually had a question for you. Aren't you going to get a ton of grain shooting 6,400 and above? Yeah. And yes, you are. Well, again, it all depends on your camera. Um, I am amazed, and let's actually, I didn't touch upon, we talked about lenses and, and, um, and, and tripods, but we didn't talk about cameras. And what I will say is uh, we are living in the golden age of digital photography, and especially now, I mean, we could call them mirrorless cameras, but let's just call them cameras right now because there are some amazing technology. The mirrorless technology does get uh, the lenses closer to the sensor, and we're, getting, we're squeezing out even higher ISOs than ever before. So, you know, I've tested a lot through B&H and through National Parks at Night. Full frame cameras are still king, you know, for night photography. And if you're going to really in seriously invest with it, I've got a Fuji system. Uh, and then I use Nikon, Sony, all the other toys out there, Canon, I've used quite a bit as well. Um, but I will say that the Fuji system, and, and that's APS, so not it's not much smaller, but it gets really maxed out, especially with Milky Way stuff. Um, so if you really want that Milky Way or, or low light, you know, or, you know, the high ISO stuff, then you're going to want to gravitate to the full frame camera system and anything really from the last couple of years, they all can get really good high ISOs at 6,400 as well beyond that. Now, that being said, just because we could shoot at 6,400 doesn't mean we have to all the time. Right, right. You know, if I'm shooting urban stuff, I'm not going to, I might do my test shots at 6,400 so I can take quicker test shots. But my urban stuff is usually shot at ISO 100 to 800 ISO. So there, I mean, yeah, Fuji's fine there. Any camera's fine there. I see a comment about a phone, you know, and, and, and Apple and Google touting about, you know, phones and the technology that they can now take Milky Way. What I say to that is, nah. <laughs> maybe but um but really not but it's getting better and maybe soon because again think of this i'm talking about squeezing out a lot of good information out of a full frame sensor and now do we go to a phone sensor that's like micromatic you know with it now yeah i would get a and i could but i can i was amazed last year i have the iphone 11 i could take bts shots of, of the students and everyone shooting with my phone doing night shots. The white balance was all messed up, uh, but I was getting, I was the tripod and it was getting pretty good. What I've now done is I now bring a, a mobile mount adapter and I might, I am testing those iPhones and the capability that they can get. Cause yeah, urban stuff, pretty good. And I, you know, the new iPhone 12 with the, with the raw, that pro raw setting. Okay. It's still going to be a small sensor, but I will be able to squeeze more information. But those full frame cameras and shooting in manual mode so that we can make the decision on what ISO, what aperture and what shutter speed we can do. So if we want better quality, we can go to a lower, we can choose to go to a lower ISO. You know, with the phones, we often can't choose that. It's kind of being chosen for us. So the more we can take control of those features, the bigger the sensor, just the more we're going to get out of it. But Bottom line, you can do night photography with almost any tool out there. Right. right and, you know, and, and again, going back to what we said uh, with intent um, versus technique. And a lot of times, you know, I, I, I go back to a story of the very first time I was fortunate to go to Italy for work for B&H. And I took the Canon 1DX, 7200, 2470, 16 to 35. I took extra <laughs> batteries. I, I, the Holy Trinity. And, 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 and then some. And two hours into hiking around Venice, it all went into my backpack and I shot for six hours on my iPhone five. Um, so again, you know, there, there are so many levels to this equation. And I, I say to who, whoever has an iPhone and wants to do it, you know, like Gabe said, let, let's test. Sometimes um, a great example is that portrait you took of Matt Hill. 
you know, yeah, it's blurry. Yeah, it's out of focus. It looks amazing. You can get some great results sometimes without constantly having to be tack sharp with things. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you, you can't compare sort of the what we've been taught to learn and to master in daytime. We can't apply it to night. It, night has its own set of rules. And even though we're using the same exposure triangle and all the same, the camera lens, we're now using them in different ways. So yes, we are going, we should be more forgiving with the noise, especially if it's the Milky Way stuff. But like I said, the Milky Way is granular. It's got, you know, cloud sparkle dust in it. That's grain, <laughs> you know? So that's a true interpretation you of know, it. And, and grain yeah. is beautiful. 90% uh, of Cartier Brisson's yeah. images yeah. have a ton of grain in them. And, you know, when we're totally. capturing a, a well-composed, beautiful image. You know, again, thank you. Every time you and I do this together, you throw in the, the Miami Blue Rothko for me. One of my favorite shots you've ever taken. <laughs> um, it also comes down to, again, when you're shooting for a certain scene, understanding this isn't going to work out the way I want it to. Horrible moon, horrible this, whatever it can be, and finding a, a creative way around it. But, you know, we, we do have a, another question. Alexander asks, when using manual focus at night, how do you manual focus with a cheaper lens? By cheaper, I mean one without a distance meter. What do you do when you can't autofocus or anything and all you have is the ring and the lens and hope? Well, you pray. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, yeah, but I, that's, that brings out a good point. Um, you know, what I, I will say, the Irix, as well as there's a bunch of other manual focus lenses right now flooding the market uh, that are inexpensive, and, and do have focusing scales. And that should be another key thing that you look for uh, because it does make it a little bit easier, but I will say also don't trust that focusing scale, you know, uh, with it because that can be tricky and especially with zoom lenses. But I do not usually generally like using um, lenses that don't have any focusing and it's just no ring at all. That is very challenging. However, there are, you know, with challenges, there are solutions. So what can we do? Well, we can get there before dawn, you know, before night, and we can focus on infinity, you know, manually focusing in daylight, and then maybe tape down the lens, you know, using gaff tape to tape down the lens, simple and easy, and now you are focused at infinity for the rest of the night. Uh, well, what if you see a Joshua tree six feet away and you want to shoot that as well? Well, now, okay, that doesn't work so well for that. So what the, the best solution would be to use your flashlight. Use a flashlight or an LED light. Hopefully, maybe you have a friend with you as well, but either with a DSLR, you go into live view and kind of blow up the scene. Maybe if you're shooting that Joshua tree, you know, zoom into that scene. And with mirrorless, obviously you see this on the back of the screen or the electronic viewfinder, but blow up that scene, shine a light on it, right? And then just rock back and forth and find that sweet spot where you are in focus. Um, that's probably the best tip um, I can give for all of us that struggle with it. We have like a 10 tips for manual focusing at the night that we'll give a bunch of others, but the, the go-to one is using a flashlight um, and shining it. And this is especially good for when we have foreground, you know, close to the scene. If we're just doing distant stuff and we can't shine a flashlight on that mountain over there, then we wanna look maybe up to the stars and maybe look for the brightest star and the brightest planet and magnify 100% on the back of the screen and slowly look. You'd be surprised, again, with what cameras uh, can see. And when we rock back and forth on those stars in manual focus, we want to really go, because we can go beyond infinity, which is even worse, dude. I don't even know what it's about. The world's like that back, back beyond infinity. Um, but we're rocking back and forth to make those stars the smallest that they are. Because when they go out of focus, they blur bigger. So we're kind of rocking it back and forth. And I'll start with a wide rock and make it smaller and smaller until I found that I've actually made the star focused at infinity. Great. That, that and, point. you know, and you, you touched on this right off the get-go. We, we are in the golden age. And I, I'm going to date myself. And, you know, Gabe, you, you, you can say you're still in your 20s and everybody will believe it we used to have to shoot on this odd thing called film and you thought you knew exactly what you were getting. And then you get into the lab and it yeah. was almost like this alchemy, this, this rolling of the dice of like, yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Did I get it? Everyone that's on here, digital has allowed us to shoot, shoot and see. And so, you know, great tips and tricks, Gabe, 
put them into practice. You know, there's so many things he's told me and I have shot straight off of my terrace to try and truly understand what it has. So digital has brought in a great way for us to truly um, see the night. Now, Guy brought up a really great question, Gabe, and this is something that I do not know that I have been a part of to ask. Does the MPF rule regarding focal length only apply to modern 35 millimeter DSLRs? How would it apply to a medium format like the Fujifilm or Phase One? Oh yeah, the uh, well, the MPF totally applies to any size, uh, large format, medium format, a limp micro four thirds. Because what MPF is basically is is this crazy math theorem that's taking the aperture. N stands for aperture. P stands for pixel density, and then uh, the other F stands for focal length, okay? So um, you're going to input all three of those factors in on that photo pills because uh, you don't want to do the math yourself. I saw the theorem. It's like nothing I want to uh, be part of. <laughs> but the theorem does it, and you can put in uh, whatever size format you have, and it will give you the proper equation for it. All right. Well, I see uh, Rick jumped in. How's it going, Rick? Hey, boys. Um, Gabe? Photography, really? You like that? I do. You like that? Hat? We, we all thought we knew everything until you said that. <laughs> you know, that's it. We're, we're doing just, you know, we're doing specific photography workshops. Now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, excellent. Uh, thank you, Gabe. That was just spectacular. We, we really enjoyed that. And your wealth of information and your delivery is wonderful. And we really appreciate that. Gabe, um, <sighs> for the essence of the pandemic in Hawaii, Yes. Um, you have some pictures, and um, you, you're a different kind of guy. We thought you'd just pick one, but you actually picked two. Can you talk to us about them? Yeah, you know, you, you, you know, people just submitted a lot of good images, they did. and and it was really a struggle. And you know, I knew I knew the cards I was dealt and what I had to play with. You know, we had, <laughs> you know, the prize for for this is six hundred dollars worth. Of B and H gift cards, yeah, wow. You know, and, and yes, six hundred going to one person could be is, is a great thing. But I was like, you know, I just there was there was two images that just kept sticking with me. And you know, I, I saw it. I made my first cull of images where I narrowed it down to like of the hundred and fifty, two hundred images you did. Yeah. I, I took three away, then I took five away. You know? um, but there was two that just kind of stuck with me and and stayed with me. And I just couldn't go back and forth on it. Um, so I'd like to definitely share the, 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 to me, the first prize that we, I divided them the first and second prize. Um, uh, so let me see if I, and this was the Ooh, first prize one. Darcy. And, and and this is Darcy Fierro. Yeah, Darcy, um, awesome photographer, great lady. I love this. And I will say, I did see quite a few of these similar shots mm -hmm. like this. Um, and, and yes, I mean, that that was such an amazing scene for you guys and and see, walking down the streets i can only imagine you know or even from your apartment cuz listen the pandemic hurt us all and it continues to be a struggle but to have that giant building have that heart yeah. and the hope yes to me that to me when we look at the essence the, it's it's this building that's providing it but now we have to look at all the other elements and what the elements here that really kind of raised Darcy above everyone else was it was a long exposure. So we see that sort of, we see the essence, yeah. we see the essence of movement. But then to me, that's that person that's right there fishing. And we have a couple other people on the, on the, on the right hand side, but it's that one person that's kind of standing under hope, mm -hmm. you know, and, and really helps give better scale and just kind of, it just made my heart skip a beat, Good, you know, for that's this. Good. So, Thank you. So Darcy, and I love the colors, textures uh, in this as well. So good time, good seizing of those long exposures, Darcy. So congratulations yeah. on, on on winning the first prize, which is uh, $400 worth of B&H gift cards. Fantastic. That's wonderful. I know she'll enjoy that. Excellent. So the second prize, you know, was well, because, uh, you know, I don't know. I know you didn't know who was going to judge what, but I know there's some night photographers yes, they are. in Hawaii. Yeah. So I have to like, you know, I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to be a judge, I'm going to default to my one true love, you know, of night photography. And, and this one, I really, I, I, the simplicity of it, and as well as the title yeah. just struck me, you know, you know Patrick Langston, uh, you know, my kind of social distancing. Yes. Yeah. Mine too, you know, <laughs> and, 
I, I love that obviously he's got his camera face the other way, you know, probably shooting the, the Milky Way over there, but he's a smart guy. He brought a second ring. Yep. And, 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 to, and to capture yourself to do that night portrait underneath the night skies, you know, is, is just, you know, yes, we'll have that moment that we'll always remember, but now to have this moment of you under the Milky Way. Nice. I, 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 yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, Patrick, congratulations. You get $200. Well done, Patrick. Congratulations. Um, Gabe, John, b &H, we really thank you for supporting us here in Hawaii. Uh, it's wonderful to have you in our living rooms and uh, to be able to give us a, a really wealth of information. And um, we love you guys and you've done well for us and we really appreciate it. So thank you both and thank you b &H, uh, for being with us today. Thank you. And, and well, thank you. We look forward to we look forward to getting back next year and hopefully uh, being all together. And uh, and sharing sharing those visions, yeah, uh, and, and inspiration and everything like that. So we hope so next year. I don't know, Rick. Is it possible I can stay in the, uh, you know, in this to chat? If, you know, we could turn things off if people. I saw some more questions, or people can also continue to reach out to me yeah. um, at Gabe at National Parks you, at Night. We, we, we cannot have. put you in right now, um, but I think that stand by so I can get my my son and Teresa. Um, Zach thinks that he can do that. So um, stand by. We'll see. We can do it. Um, okay. All of you out there, if you haven't registered for Bella's uh, workshop, which is coming up in 30 minutes, please do so. Uh, Peter Hurley coming up, Red Cinema, and then Zach Noyle is going to come in with, uh, you know, uh, what he's like. <laughs> and um, There's going to be a lot of shebanging around. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, we've had a great time with the two of you. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you, John. It's been fabulous. Thank you. Um, so it was our, you our honor there? to be here. Oh, well, thank you so much. All right. So I, I will stick around as much as I can to answer questions in the chat, I guess. Yep. Um, I did see one. Well, I did see one about... Um, let me see if we, I can do it. I can do it until someone shuts off my volume. I guess I could do it verbally yeah, do it too. Verbally. That's, so that's that's some of the questions that we did not get to were uh, thoughts on Star Trackers, a little bit mm -hmm. more of a discussion on the Luxley series, and then yep. uh, the other one was ND filters. So those those are kind of the three that I didn't did not have an opportunity to get to. So yeah, as long as you're uh, able to uh, talk, I'm game. Yeah, I'm and game. Angie, if you're if so you're answering, Gabe is going to put a link for his tripod guide. It is the definitive pro guide to tripods um, and as he said you know uh, peak design is an amazing tripod it does have uh, its first gen series i'm personally a manfrotto and get so man um, but gabe just put that link on there and uh, you know we can go from there um gabe i'm gonna yeah. dip off and angie just said she's looking at that that peak design one angie get the carbon fiber spend a couple hundred a hundred dollars more get the carbon fiber i'm, I'm telling you it's it's gonna it's better it's it just it's a it's a light it's a lighter thing unless you're just shooting by your car but if you're doing any sort of hiking or anything carbon fiber is always going to win so um let's hit, let's hit those nd question uh because that's an easy yep. one um i do use nds um when uh shooting urban night photography i don't use it for my astro work um i don't use it you know um for, but that shot you saw of uh san francisco top of twin peaks that was with a six stop nd filter so I use it Vegas, New York, wherever I'm in a city and I want to push car trails longer. Um, that's when I would kind of use it uh, for, for that uh, work. So that would be the ND. Um, what was the other one? Oh, uh, Star Trackers. Star Trackers, I'm starting to dip my toes into. I've, I've actually had one from like 10 or 15 years ago, and I liked it. But here's the problem with Star Trackers. They are getting a lot of love now. What a star tracker does is basically you have your tripod, then you put a star tracker, um, kind of acts as the, the head uh, for you. Um, and whether you put the head on top of that star tracker or the star tracker, you know, acts as that head. It's going to move with the rotation of the earth. So basically you can get longer exposures with star points, which is a great idea, right? So now I don't have to raise up my ISO so high. Right now, I can maybe shoot at 800 ISO, 1600 ISO, 
um, and now get that same, you know, instead of using the NPF rule and being limited to 10, 15 seconds, I can now shoot for maybe up to four minutes with a star tracker, which is awesome. However, this is really made for astro, for astro uh, photography. And, and the definition of astrophotography is no landscape, right? When we're just looking at, you know, the celestial beings in the sky, right? Um, when we include the foreground, and whether it's just a tree, a hill, a mountain, whatever it could be, you know, we are going with the rotation of the earth. So we're moving. So our foreground is going to be blurry. Our skies will be perfectly sharp, but our foreground is going to be blurry, you know, on that so because again the star tracker is moving the solution for that is to take use the star tracker as that sky shot and then take a turn the star tracker off but without you know changing the composition you just turn off so that it doesn't move take that uh, that landscape shot and then you're going to blend them together which again i showed blending images together in the milky way stuff so i'm already doing that um Star trackers tend to be a little bit on the heavier side, though I will say move, shoot, move is a new brand. Uh, Max b &H doesn't carry them yet. I'm trying, but they're super compact <laughs> um, and they are great. But I think we are, we have the regular Star Trekker um, is a really good one as well. But it could sometimes add another two to three pounds to your kit. So that's another consideration with them as well. But I think we'll see them becoming more and more useful. But remember... You're going to have to do more posts afterwards. So if you're not a post person, you might not want to do it. That's great. Uh, I think the only other one that we kind of jumped over, uh, Jason just asked if you had ever shot with anything as uh, wide as an eight millimeter. Sure. I've shot fisheye. Fisheye can be super fun at night. Imagine a star trail circle around, you know, with a lighthouse and then a circle around the fisheye just kind of enveloping it all. Hell yeah, do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, you know, the wider you go, the, the, and this is for day and night, the more of a challenge it's going to be for you to uh, have that strong composition. You're going to have to get closer to your subject, you know, just make sure that it's just not a kind of a boring image, right? So get close to that subject and then have that sky play out as you like, but totally creative. I remember I was in the Outer Banks teaching a workshop and Nikon had sent us a bunch of lenses to play with and one of them was that eight to 15 yeah. lens and uh i put it on i couldn't take it off <laughs> i couldn't take it off just because i was like whoa this is a whole other world of seen i you know i couldn't take it off so the circular fisheye the rectilinear fisheye um that's all good oh and one other thing on, on filters too just jumping back um there also have been some great um advances in um what we call like light pollution filters and sometimes I'm not using them, but National Parks at Night just did a few uh, blogs. And I think, is there an ebook on? There's not an ebook yet, but I believe there is going to soon be an ebook on our, um, you know, on, on the testing of the uh, light, uh, light pollution filters and just what you can do to help balance the, uh, the color of the night. Because this is something that's very interesting. Um, for us to do. I don't mind having a little bit of light pollution, you know, in the scene. Um, I, cause I think that warmth can kind of balance sometimes if I shoot at a lower color temperature, so it can kind of balance that. And there's some creative possibilities, uh, with it. But if you are someone that's just very annoyed with light pollution or it's overtaking your scene, which it could very well, then definitely, um, their light pollution filters, are a wonderful solution for that. And I just dropped a link to a blog, um, uh, how to deal with light pollution part one. And we did, it was a three part series. So follow that along um, and and you can really get, get kind of understand the color of, of night and, and the variety of things that we can do with it. So I also dropped in an email for everyone that's still here, bhshows at bhphoto.com. And, and that's gonna be a great email for you if you wanna keep digging in a little bit deeper. So specifically, Guy, you asked a question regarding which Luxley has which capabilities. That's a very broad and, and large conversation. Obviously, Gabe can speak a little bit more towards what he is using for uh, night and astrophotography. However, they have a, a range large enough for one-by-ones for studio. Um, 
So the BH shows at bhphoto.com will send you directly to one of us reps that can kind of dig in and get to the meat of kidding questions like that. Uh, but you know, that, that is a kind of a great lead up. We love the Luxleys, you know, uh, they're fantastic mm -hmm. units. Um, I, I guess less of going into, uh, the breadth of the question that guy had and more to why you chose the Luxley you chose to take out into the field. All right, so the, the, I, I, something I didn't mention about lenses, just because we could just talk for hours and hours about this, but uh, another key component to choosing your lens is finding a lens that doesn't suffer from what's called coma. You know, and a coma is a chromatic aberration that happens um, at, at bright light sources, uh, particularly stars uh, and planets. And it's not something, it's you know, camera manufacturers are now starting to listen to night photographers we were like the stepchild in the night photography community or the photo community for so many years. But now um, lenses are, newer lenses are definitely being made with uh, battling coma and chromatic aber aberrations. Because what happens um, with coma is if you shoot a, let's say a 20 millimeter 1.8 wide open at 1.8 and you really look at those stars, especially along the edges, um, what you'll notice, and this isn't a lot of lenses, is when you shoot it wide open along the edges, if you look at those bright stars, they will be star points, but they'll also look like there'll be a, like a line going through them. They'll be they'll be actually looking like a little spaceship, you know, um, and that's something that can be very distracting uh, from your image and especially when we're trying to do it. How is it solved? Usually by stopping down, right? If we stop down that lens, but if we have to stop down a 1.8 lens to F4 lens, then what am I even using that lens for? You know, um, so... The Irix lenses, uh, that 15 millimeter 2.4 lens, has got a little bit of uh, chromatic aberration in the edges. But if you stop it down to, uh, it's wide open at 2.4. If you stop it down to 2.8 um, to 3, 3.2, um, you'll notice that it's all gone. So for me, that gives me something working uh, to deal with. Uh, but a lot of the other, you know, uh, lenses, some of the 14, 24, 16, the 35s, they, at 2.8, I hope I don't have to stop down. So test it out. You know, bring your camera, bring your lens out on a dark, you know, on a starry night and just take pictures of the stars, bring home that image and really look at the edges of uh, the scene and take images wide open and then do like third stop increments to stop down because uh, you'll notice and look for those chromatic in, uh, aberrations. And that could be a really good guide. And Irix does a very good job. Whereas like the Rokinon, Samyang, Bauer, and my experiences, um, I just been burned by them. They were great at the beginning or great at getting the marketing materials out there. Uh, but they're for me, so I, I have had to return five of those lenses, uh, either because the edges were soft, which can be another, uh, another problem with wide angle lenses that are fast is that I don't mind them vignetting. I like a little vignette, you know, that we can either embrace or take away. But what was happening was just soft really on the edges. And, and they would also uh, suffer from a little bit of a uh, coma as well. So I like the Irix, but I think, you know, I think Canon, Sony, Nikon, Sigma, you know, are all putting out some, some very good lenses, but test them out, you know, because again, we all have our own threshold. <laughs> Um, well, Gabe, you know, as always, it, it was a pleasure. I learned a lot. Time is never our friend when it comes to picking your brain. So many outlets. Uh, again, thank you all for being here. Please visit bnhphoto.com. We gave you some promo codes. I will be on in the background throughout the rest of the day for chats. So also feel free to shoot me anything that you may want to follow up again. BH shows at BH Photo will be the email for our sales guys. Gabe, I feel like we could do this for eight hours. Unfortunately, I think our time is done. We do have to share the stage yeah. with some other people. Yeah, yeah, right. Give people a little break in between. One thing I do want to shout out, though, uh, I don't know if I don't think it's up officially, but we can at least tease people that we're going to be back. We're we're having such a good time uh, here that I think uh, stay tuned because we're going to have a B and H tech session with Photocon on Wednesday uh, from uh, I think it's from eight. 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Uh, Hawaii time uh, for four hours. So 9 to like 1 p.m. I think it is. So stay tuned for that information. Um, I'll be actually giving a tripod talk. So we'll do a deep dive into 
uh, the tripods at that point. But I think uh, Godox is going to be there. We're going to go a little bit more into that. We're going to talk about printing um, as well. And then what was the other one? Why am I spacing? Oh, Fuji's going to be there as well to kind of break down. So Ken is going to talk about printers. Fuji's going to break down their systems more. So join us if you can Wednesday for our tech talk as well. And that will be up on the website. Soon. Fantastic. And Gabe and I will have different Aloha shirts on. We're going to spread it out. <laughs> Promise. Promise. So good seeing all of you. I look forward to seeing you in the questions and again on Wednesday. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks all. Seize the night. <laughs>